I now know after 13 years of my journey with the book, because I've essentially, I finished the book and immediately started writing the adaptation. I mean, really, actually, I shut the book and then the laptop came open and, because it was sort of like a, it was an intense experience for me. I couldn't stop myself. But in the 13 years of that and developing the script, having the nerve to show it to people, having the nerve to sort of stand up and say, yes, this is the first movie that I want to make in this very precise, ambitious way, um, also paralleled my uncovering of any remaining mysteries around my family. I now know that my grandfather did indeed pass white for his entire life. He also passed Native American. Uh, but I know. Uh, it's a fascinating story. Both of his parents were black. His father was a man called John Williams, who turns out to have been a race man. He was born enslaved and then he went to Washington. He got a job in government. He, uh, he knew Frederick Douglass. In fact, he toasted him at an event at the White House. I mean, I'm only saying this because, you know, all histories are extraordinary. I'm not saying because mine happens to have some of these elements of huge sort of touchstones of American history makes it particularly special, but the point is, it was a race. My mother didn't know this, and now she does. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about, you said that when you finished reading the novel, mm. um, you immediately opened up the, the laptop, and yeah. I just want to hear a little bit more about the kind of that, the kind of tactility of that, <laughs> that the kind of the sensuality of holding a book in the hand, and then moving to a different technology that is the kind of typewriter to yeah. translate that emotion. And, and, I, and I, I, I'm trying to give a word to that emotion and I'm inviting you to help me think about that. Like the word that immediately comes to mind is catharsis, but I, I'm not quite sure if there was a thing you were trying to reconcile before if you didn't know. Um, no, you're right. I, I, don't, I don't know how to, um, it, it was a bit like a catharsis, more like when you need to throw up. <laughs> You know, I couldn't, um, I think the use of the word sensuality is interesting because it was a sort of, it was a tactile ex experience and the, the sort of, I mean, the sort of simplest way to put it is I got to about page 10, the scene where they're, I don't know if it is page 10, but roughly in that area, the scene where they meet in the tea room in the Drayton Hotel. And I'm suddenly seeing it in black and white. I'm suddenly seeing it in 4-3. I'm like, well, this is about categories, so they have to be constrained. I'm, I literally want to put them in a box. This has to feel bound and claustrophobic and black and white. And I saw this panning shot, and I saw this idea of placing Irene in a momentarily voyeuristic space where she's looking at people as opposed to being scrutinized, which she so often is during the rest of the story. And this panning shot where she sees Claire and also her seeing Claire for the first time and crossing her legs and I heard the sound effect of the nylons. I mean, it was all these, I mean, I'm citing these details that made it into the movie. I promise you there were an awful lot that didn't make it into the movie and I erased 13 years of editing and, and processing. But there was so much, there was so much that I couldn't hold back. And, you know, you asked me about the process and I think, I think the fact that I did shut the book and open the laptop also meant that I wasn't really being honest with myself about really wanting to turn it into a film. It just felt something personal and an exercise for me. And I think that gave me complete freedom just to get all of the ideas out and into a script form. Um, I honestly didn't think it would be my first film at that point. You did not? No, I did not. I thought I'd be out of my mind. Do you want to say what that first thought was? <laughs> I just thought you'd have to be—you'd have to be insanely arrogant to decide to make a a work of literature that you were in awe of as your first film, and make it formally ambitious, and in black and white, and in four three, and about you know a very potent subject matter. Like that is insane. I'm not going to do that. That'll be my fourth or fifth film. But, you know, I grew up and realized that making any film is an act of insane arrogance. So you might as well start off with the most arrogant one you got. <laughs> a moment ago, you said that there's a bunch of stuff that's in the film, but a bunch of stuff that didn't quite make it in the mm. film. And one of the things that's kind of lingering in the background, as it were, is Chicago. Mm. And the first part of the, of the novel. And 
what kinds of editorial decisions did you have to make about Chicago relative to New York, New York relative to Chicago? Um, not in the sense of kind of competing metropolises, but the kind of backstory, mm. personal backstory to Irene and Claire, and what Chicago does to inform your viewers about how they're thinking about class, about sensuality, about sexuality, mm -hmm. and about gender mm -hmm. that's very local to Chicago. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh boy, um, it was. Uh, this was a tough call for me because I understood the historical context of Chicago. I understood why it works so well in the novel. But the sort of touchstone of the adaptation for me was something that I felt in the spirit of the novel, which was economy, simplicity, because it allows for the complexity. And I don't think there had to be space to let it sing. And I think in film terms, to switch locations to hold two cities would have diffused some of that tension. I mean, maybe not if I'd had an enormous budget. I didn't. This was a super scrappy indie that was brought together from lots of different sources. And, you know, it was seven years of people telling me, we'll give you more money if you make it in color, or we'll give you more money if you change these aspects of the story. And me saying, no, I'll make it for less than it. It has to be this way. But so, yes, yeah, some of it's practical. Like, I, there's no way I could have gone to Chicago. But another side is just streamlining the narrative into a sort of very snapshot, tense place. And maybe I should just sit back further. Is that, am I, sorry, am I blowing the mic by talking into it? Can you all hear me now? Got it. Um, okay can be loud. I'm not <laughs> always very loud. Um, what was I saying? I suppose, you know, I, everyone thinks of New York during the 20s and they think, instantly they think jazz age, they think loud, they think bustly, they think big cityscapes. And again, for me, it was this idea of simplicity and economy. I actually wanted to make something that was counterintuitively very quiet, very pared down, very claustrophobic. You know, I didn't really want to see the big perspective. I couldn't afford the big perspective, but I didn't actually want to see it. I wanted to see this woman's perspective, Irene's perspective of a city that is narrow and cloying. She sees the same bit of street, so you only get one angle of that bit of street that she walks again and again. There's a repetition, there's a monotony there. You only see the world as she sees it, in the way that a lot of New Yorkers see it. It's only very fancy people that live in high rises that get to see the whole city. Most of the time you're just seeing a tiny bit of street and, a, and you're f the four walls of your apartment. So there is, so that sort of hot housing the action into one location was partially to do with that. Yeah, I mean, I love this idea too of the kind of the economy of, of that, those acts of viewing, uh, and those, those acts of kind of being as characters in the, in the film. Uh, viewing is such an important part of, of how you have crafted your art as, mm -hmm. a, as a director, but viewing is also very central to these characters. Um, the look, the gaze, uh, moments of, of, of staring. And a moment ago, you just used this phrase, um, these, kind of, these narrow perspectives. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking the way in which um, these kind of these corridors of intimacy or created between Irene and, and Claire. And if you could talk about how you crafted, you know, on the one hand, as you pointed out, um, only the very wealthy usually get to be on, on high and, and, and look down. In fact, that's the opening scene in the novel version. Right? Mm. She's at the Drake or at the Drayton around the corner here, and she's looking, looking down. Um, but your technique here and your your, your practice, and I think a real deep investment in, and not simply seeing, seeing things on the ground, so to speak, mm. but allowing us to see what Irene sees, mm -hmm. which is so unusual to have an audience see what a black woman sees. So I'm trying to think about how to call that or identify this kind of corridor of intimacy mm. or, or kind of mm. corridor of vision that is filtered through her eyes, that is seen through her perspective rather than mm, mm. someone looking at her, mm. rather than just someone looking at her. Yeah. Well, 
it's informed by someone looking at her. She's kind of unlocked by someone looking at her on some level, you know. I you know, it was always the it was always the fundamental problem. Maybe problem is a little harsh. Challenge. <laughs> I would like to put a more positive spin on it. A challenge of the book that it is not in the first person, but it feels that way. Because you're granted this enormous access to the interiority of Irene, who who's having a nervous breakdown. I mean, is the only way to put it. I mean, she's Nella Larson sort of telegraphs that it's about this one character who's hiding her racial identity. But the truth is, and the kind of big sort of turn of the book is that it's actually about the one who's not hiding her racial identity, but is arguably hiding everything else about herself. You know, she's so bound up in her own social performance and her own ideas of of what it is to do the right thing and to be the right kind of woman, the right kind of wife, the right kind of mother, the right kind of member of the black community, the right kind, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but there's this, there's a sense that she's so bound by that, those ideas that she doesn't actually know who she is or what she wants. And the one who is performing something is actually free to be completely herself on some level. So for me, it was like, how do you, how do you, sh how do you slowly let the audience understand that the person whose eyes you are seeing the world through is crumbling and unreliable? Because even if you could give her a monologue that sort of revealed herself, her truth, it wouldn't be true because she, inside is lies anyway. She's not, she's not being honest with herself about the effect that this woman has on her, everything that it unlocks in her. So it became about exactly what you're saying, sort of playing with that sense of perspective. So, I mean, a lot of the times it's unnoticeable, but you're, you're watching the movie through her eyes and then I started playing with the moments where things literally go out of focus. Or for example, when she's coming down the stairs and she sees them standing very close together in the reflection of a mirror and then she comes around the corner and it's just a sort of trick of whatever and actually they're standing much further apart. So even if you, and I, there were some liberties that I took that were very sp specific in this area, like it was very important to me to keep all the possibilities alive. So even, even two minutes before the very end of the movie, if you are someone in the audience, of which I'm sure there are some, there are always some, who are absolutely convinced that he's had an affair, if you're listening closely, right at the end, he whispers in her ear, I love you. And that was just to play, for those people of the audience that are convinced, just so that you have to leave the cinema thinking, oh, maybe actually it wasn't, maybe it was the other thing. You know, and also, but also to go back to your point about the gaze and the perspective, it's like, it's also oral, you know, there's a, the sound design was incredibly important to me because it was another way to access her interiority. You know, it's not realistic, it's expressionistic. And she hears things all the time that don't make any sense. Like, you know, the bird tweets and the traffic noises are very deliberate. When, I, when Claire crosses her legs and Irene sees that, the sound of the stockings is very loud. I mean, she's sitting a long way away. There's no way she would hear that sound as loudly as she does. But this sort of force you into her, the things that hit her on a sensual level. It just occurred to me a moment ago when you were speaking about perspective that even though the kind of the frontispiece of the novel is about this very fraught, intimate, and complicated relationship between two women, which would make just for a great story unto itself. Mm. But, um, but the way you've been talking about Irene almost makes this like a, a character study of her. I mean, you said she is a woman who's, who's, who's breaking down. Um, she is um, disallowed um, a monologue. Um, but what we do have are lots of interior thoughts that are afforded to us by uh, Nella Larson. Mm. I wonder how you negotiated mm. those mm. inside voices, <laughs> if you will. Um, yeah, that... well, it became, vis it became a sort of visual language. There are some sort of, you know, Claire, for example, talks about, she explicitly says, I'm not safe. And whether she means I'm not safe because I'll do anything I want to get what I want, or whether she means I'm literally not safe because I carry around this seed of danger with me everywhere I go. It's kind of both. But sort of by the by, Irene is the one in the movie anyway, who is literally unsafe, as in she drops stuff. You know, she, she's dangerous. <laughs> 
And she's and that's sort of a way of cluing up this idea that she's quietly a powder keg. Um, there are there are you know also the use of mirrors. There are these moments where you do sort of glimpse at maybe something else, and there's a lot of that. There are also something that I loved playing with was holding the two of them in one shot for as much as possible and shooting it from angles where you could be aware of one of them looking at the other in private without the other one knowing and seeing and also seeing the effect of Claire like she's this sort of you know she's this kind of charisma of sunshine that kind of when it's shining on you you can see Irene being like oh I'm 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 beautiful <laughs> it's all okay and then when it goes away she's lost again and those sort of private moments of seeing that when Claire's not looking at her and seeing Irene have that experience was was very important as well obviously that relies heavily on the brilliance of these actors both of which are extraordinary so we'd love to follow up a little bit more about uh, Ruth Naga and Tessa Thompson in, in a moment. Um, I want to just separate out, if I can, for the audience, um, both here and online, like your role as a kind of screenwriter and then your mm. role as, as director. Mm. You've already been kind of intimating some of the choices, you, artistic choices you made with, with the mirrors and adding on phrases like I love you at the, at the mm. very end here. But um, as, a, as a director, when you... Um, or behind the camera and you're trying to capture shots or translate a certain kind of vision mm. um, in a novel and in a story that depends upon acts of seeing and acts of misreading mm -hmm. that which is before your very eyes. One of the, one of the most explosive scenes and one of the most complicated scenes is when John Ballou uh -huh. comes in uh -huh. in the afternoon during their tea party and can't quite see uh -huh, what's uh -huh. in front of him, uh -huh. even though he's already uh -huh. engaged in a whole kind of racial discourse uh -huh. um, and has has deployed this kind of moniker, this racial epithet uh -huh. as a term of endearment. And he, he, he thinks he has a sense, he thinks he has this kind of awareness that he could identify an Afro-American or a black person if they were in his midst. And yet there are three of them who are quote unquote legally black uh, but and culturally black, but they, uh -huh. uh, but he can't quite see them. How did you work at that? And that, so, uh, the, the character uh, John Belue is played by Alexander Skarsgård, who's uh. an amazing actor, actor. But how did you how did you work through the kind of the practice and politics of of seeing, but also not not seeing? Yeah, uh, Marty Rogers, our costume designer, who's extraordinary and from Chicago, incidentally. Um, I remember she read the script, and I took a meeting with her, and she was talking about that scene. Um, in the meeting and she was like white man sees what he wants to see <laughs> and I was like yeah I mean it's about context there is a there is a there's a deliberate oppressive whiteness to that scene literally in the way we shot it like the walls are white everyone's wearing white there's a huge amount of light coming in the side window um, and I think what I was thinking was to sort of highlight that very idea, like in this context, in this room, in this white world, this man holds all the power and he's the one that gets to name what he sees. He can say what he sees. He can say, he can see what he wants to see in that context because he holds that power. And that was a more interesting place to go from rather than, I don't know, it's also the black and white affords me this, right? Um, and it was very important to me that while he's seeing what he wants to see, the audience is only seeing them as black. And to do that, I had to cast people who, two women who an audience have a fixed idea of their racial identity as black, because then I have something, then the film has something from which to destabilize that fixed idea from and to call into question the kind of swirling nature of all this stuff. <laughs> you know, and I, and I think it's more, I think it, it, it's, more, it's a more provocative option than creating a space with two actors that we know to look very white or to be white, um, which I think would be a different kind of feeling.
I don't think you would have that fear. I mean, how did you, how did you work around that, that opportunity or how did you turn that obstacle into an opportunity? So Ruth Nega is an amazing actress um, and is in a film from 2016, mm -hmm. Loving, mm -hmm. about the Jerome Loving case, and um, who um, obviously had to visibly and perceptibly play a character who was black. Mm -hmm. And Tessa Thompson was, was most recently in Sylvia's Love, mm -hmm. where she is uh, the daughter of an African-American uh, record shop owner. Mm -hmm. So how did you, like, you're also working in the kind of um, a moment right now where we have very strong black female actors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and you had to, what's the phrase here? Uh, I don't know. I don't know where you're going with this. <laughs> um, neutralize or, or destabilize their, 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 their blackness in a way to make them pass, as, uh -huh. to make them as characters who could pass. Well, it's because, it's because the movie's in black and white. There is a heightened reality that is abstracted. You know, there's not, it doesn't look like, the, I mean, it always struck me that the most interesting way to make a movie about colorism was to take all the color out of it. It renders it metaphorical. And also, the ultimate sort of joke, if you will, <laughs> is that all of these categories a kind of a nonsense, including the idea that black and white film is black and white because black and white film is gray. It's a thousand shades of gray. So, um, so speaking of black and white film there and the, the gray or the gray zone, this, this kind mm. of unclear, ambiguous space of, mm. of interaction that is highly fraught mm. between, especially between uh, Irene and, and Claire. I wonder if you could say, a, for our audience, it's just a little bit more about their the kind of counterpart characters. So John Ballou and, mm -hmm. and Brian. Brian is um, Irene's husband, who is a black professional and is a doctor, and is at pains to convince his wife that mm -hmm. as a black family, they'd be better off leaving the U.S. and going to Brazil. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, John has made his money in speculation in somewhere in South America. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the, both of the husbands have some kind of affinity mm -hmm. with some places, not the US. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Brian's character was always played by the incredible Andre Holland. Um, I mean, I always found his, his character really interesting because I, I had conversations with everybody in the cast, everybody in the crew actually, that were you know, along the lines of everything about this production, about this movie that we're making has to be passing. Like every character is passing on some level. Even the movie itself is passing. It has its own cinematic performance, being black and white, being sort of cinematically beautiful in that way. It has its own kind of dialogue with cinema and that thing. So, you know, this went to the the, the grips, the cinematography department, the costume department, the costumes, you know, some of them are actually 1950s costumes. You know, it went to the, the production design. It's not really the 1920s, but it isn't not either. Um, and when it came to speaking to Andre about this, it was really interesting. Because I was like, well, how is this, how is this man passing who and how do you hold all the ideas that you hold? How do you, how do you look from the perspective of Irene like someone who is capable of having an affair, but also at times from the perspective of the audience as someone who is desperately in love with his wife but just can't access her and is actually making a lot of sense by saying, I want to get out of this place. I mean, I found it really refreshing that a character written in 1929 um, that a black character in that context would be saying, actually, this place is a hellscape, let's get out of it. Um, and I wanted to lean into that idea, but also Andre and I spoke a lot about the fact that the conversations that they have, him and Irene, are sadly every bit as relevant now as they were in 1929. I mean, parents, is, parents of black children are still having the discussion about how to do this. Do we, you know, do you do it in a, do you protect them? Do you keep them in a in a bubble of protection, where, or do you tell them how it's going to be and protect them that way? And that's the conversation they're having. That is um, 
we have some we have a, a few more minutes before uh, questions a few more minutes before questions so we just maybe ask you one or two more questions and then we'll move to to the audience and um the there's so much about this film um in terms of its cinematography in terms mm. of how you were thinking about the intimacy of landscapes as they're mm. walking through um personal streets that have brownstones and the like um that make this feel really different than other film adaptations about the Roaring Twenties, the most conspicuous of which, of course, is The Great Gatsby, mm -hmm. um, which has been done several times over. But I wonder if you could say to us or talk a little bit about how this is not simply, or how this is different than simply kind of a black version of the kind of decadence of, of, of the jazz age and, and why the kind of complexities of this relationship are different than the ones that Jay Gatsby mm -hmm. um, and Nick Carraway kind of suffered through. Like, but what's like? Well, for a start, it centers on the emotional lives of two black women. <laughs> That's I mean. That's a very big start. That in yeah. itself yeah. is a very big, big yeah. start. It's yeah. a very big difference. I mean, I don't know. It's it's a sort of. I mean, what I find personally extraordinary about the book, aside from my sort of personal connection to it that unlocked so much for me is that she transcends the specificity of race fairly quickly and actually brings into relief this idea of that I think any one of us struggle with at any given time of how do you negotiate your identity how do you negotiate the the tension between the story that you all telling yourself about yourself and the one that society is putting on you and this of course is you know we have words like intersectionality to describe how all these things intersect and are affected by the larger systems that these particular women are operating under but it's i think that is a is the discourse that she's really getting at like what do you think you believe and how does that not match up with what you want so this will be my last question for Rebecca, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. And I've been really generous over the course of the conversation to say, um, to give us snippets about your artistic practices. And I just want to ask you a question specifically about being a director and the kinds of decisions that you have to make um, regarding a kind of four three aspect ratio or black and white age you talked about in terms mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. Um, the gray zone effect, um, your casting choices, like how did, how did you have a, the confidence or what was it, did you say crazy or insane? It has to be an insane project. Um, or something uh, all, I said all of those all things. Of those things yeah. Yeah. Um, in the kind of schizophrenia of making, yeah. a, in the kind of schizophrenia of making a film, yeah. and your first one at that, like how did you, how did you make decisions about each one of these aspects? So the film ratio, uh, black and white, the, the casting decisions, it, from what I read before, it, it seems that both Nega and Thompson had signed on quite early. Yeah, they stuck with it for, well, Tessa for two years and, and Ruth stuck with it for three before I got all the funding. Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't easy. Um, you're asking me how I like, came up with all that stuff? Yeah, how did you, yeah, just, just give all your secrets away. <laughs> this is a moment of re revelation. I'm not sure that I have a good answer. I don't, I've written other screenplays. I thought about making other films, but I didn't have such clarity of idea about how to make the other ones as I did this one. And I, I don't entirely understand it. There was just always one way to make this film for me. I'm sure there are many other ways to adapt this book and, uh, you know, are many will be many other versions of it but this was my version of it and there was only there was only this version thank you so much rebecca thank you so as carrie mentioned there's a microphone over there and uh we'll also be fielding questions over the the, the interwebs the interwebs uh oh um, uh, what is it called? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to return to the question about the cinematography 
I thought the, it was just elegant, the way the camera studied those faces. And you mm. mentioned you specifically did want the two women in many shots. How did you find this amazing cinematography? And what's the dance and the decision making um, in coming up with this really elegant look? Yeah, it's funny, actually. I mean, usually there's a sort of Usually there's a very luxurious honeymoon period between a cinematographer and a director where they sort of, you know, waltz around and lie in fields daydreaming about how the aesthetics of their movie is going to work. I didn't get that because um, I, I hired actually, an, initially I really wanted to work with a woman cinematographer and I hired a brilliant woman who was perfect for the job but she had a, a really unfortunate scheduling conflict right at the 11th hour, like right in pre-production. Um, and so I had to call someone that I knew would be brilliant and that I already had a shorthand with, and that was Edu Grau, who I'd worked with twice as an actor. And honestly, when he arrived, there wasn't much time. And I had spent the best part of, I don't know, two, three years uh, storyboarding everything by hand. So, when, and shot listing. <laughs> Now, like, so he, I just sort of gave him the, and I was like, this, these are the, these are the blocking ideas. This is the formality. This is the style. This is the thing. I was very prescriptive about it. And he just instantly got it. He was like, oh, I see. You're after something that is, has its kind of this heightened performative beauty. And yes, it is beauty, but it's not beauty for beauty's sake. It's this sort of, it's a little cloying deliberately. And he understood that and came up with, a couple of just inspired ideas which sung to all of these things that I've been thinking about. Um, one of the first things was he brought the idea of using these anamorphic, very wide lenses called Lomos. And now there's no way you, uh, you could really shoot an entire movie on Lomo lenses because it sort of looks like a music video. It's like very, it's, I don't know how to describe it. It's sort of soft on, uh, on the top and the bottom of the, of the frame. But if you condense that frame into 4.3, you sort of focus the eye into the, the focal point of that image. And it creates, it sort of has this distortion of depth of field, but it also creates something that looks kind of unlike anything else. And it was, it was the sweet spot. I mean, when I saw those lenses, I was like, oh, okay, this is, we've got it. And that is Edu's brilliance. And, you know, he understood the language that I was, the cinematic language that I was trying to go for and just enriched it and enriched it and enriched it again. So it's a kind of fluid process. A lot of it is staging, a lot of it. And with these two actors, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a funny thing to be in a director who has been an actor because I knew I was going to them and I was saying the thing that actors least like to hear. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'm so glad you're in this movie. This movie is stylized, it's heightened, it's formal. The frame is so tiny, you've got to hit your mark because if you don't, you might just disappear out of the frame. So I'm giving you limitations and boundaries. Try and make that work for you because it's part of the story anyway. But I, I want to give you complete emotional freedom within those boundaries, but you have certain boundaries in terms of the staging to get this effect. Um, fortunately, they loved that idea and really went with it. Thank you. Well, congratulations. I had the opportunity to watch the film last night oh. and it was quite an experience. And I'm looking, I'm actually looking, I don't usually watch a movie twice. I want to go back and see it again because seeing the end makes me want to go back and see all the things I missed because I was worrying about, well, how is this, what's going to happen next? <laughs> and I think that's good. So <laughs> to it. Um, but I was wondering, is part of the passing also, since we don't see the, the backstory of when they were younger and knew mm. each other, is part of the passing, passing um, with, um, or dealing with money where they might not have had it before? Because I thought a key scene was Irene um, dealing with her housekeeper or maid yeah. or nanny. Yeah, Zulina, yeah. And yeah. that interaction really struck me yeah. um, at the time. Yeah, it's, it's deliberate. I mean, it's in the book. In the book, she's, Zulina is, is described quite unfavorably, honestly. Um, and I, I suppose my little deviation from that was that 
as sort of objectively as I can say this without sort of objectifying the wonderful Ashley Jenkins who plays Zulina, I wanted to cast someone who was the same age as the two women mm. and also objectively beautiful. And I suppose the sort of, <laughs> the thing that this sort of calls into question is when you have the three of them in the same shot, there's a sort of immediate financial correlation with the, their complexion. There's nothing separating this women other than the shades of their skin. And I did find those relationships a very important way of highlighting the class elements, how the class elements intersect with all of this. Because Irene doesn't know how to talk to her maid. She's very uncomfortable, but at the same time, she has no capacity to actually take over the domestic chores. Like, there's a deliberate shot of when Claire comes to visit the house and they go up the stairs and then down the stairs and then up the stairs again and then down the stairs again. And everyone would say to me, why the hell can't you just do this scene in one room? Like, what is the, what is the point of this? And I'm like, well, I kind of want to feel that she's being chased around her house, but I also want Irene to be running into these corners where she feels that she can get some strength back. And one of those places might be the kitchen. But the truth is she goes in the kitchen and she just sort of half-heartedly sniffs the soup because she doesn't actually know what the... You know, and it's just like, just actually get me out of the kitchen as soon as possible. And meanwhile, Claire is like, oh, what a fabulous maid. Like, isn't she great? And comes at it from a, a really, like, different class perspective of someone who is really easy with employment like that. Um, and that, you know, th those are small things. I'm glad you picked up on that. Thank you. <laughs> I could keep going on about that. I'm sure that's on. Um, sorry my glasses and I had to take my mask off. Um, I'm trying to read a question from online. And the question is, uh, it's Claire's end fall. Um, intentional? Not? Do you want to leave it vague? What are your thoughts? The question is, did I leave it intentionally vague? Of course I did. <laughs> of course. I, it, two things. Like, you know, people ask me, what do you think happens at the end? I'm like, yeah, sure, Irene pushed her. John pushed her too. Also, she fell. Also, it was an accident. Like, all of these things are true. Everyone is responsible on some level. I, you know, I don't think, I think even at the time that the book came out, there was some, yes, it was celebrated, but it was also slightly misinterpreted to a point that Nella Larson found kind of difficult. You know, people took it at face value and assumed it was a, a morality tale with Irene being the morally righteous one and Claire being punished for making this choice. And actually, she takes essentially that trope and does quite the opposite. You know, she's not critiquing the person for passing. She's critiquing the society that makes it necessary. And when everyone, when she falls out the window, everyone is responsible because no one can handle her freedom. No one can handle her desires. That she is, I, I want and I'm going to do what I have to do to get it. That destabilizes everybody, black and white. And also, the second point is, even if Irene didn't push her, when she's standing at that window, she has to think that she did or that she might have been part of it, whether it was conscious or deliberate or not. Because that's what she's left with, and that's actually what's probably going to change her. I like to fantasize a lot about, you know, what's left for Irene and Brian after the movie ends. You know, and actually she's been cra so cracked open that maybe there's hope that they might start communicating. Maybe there's hope that she'll leave and, and you know, I don't know, realize she's gay. But anyway, that's another... <laughs> Thank I just wanted to tell you that I saw the movie last night. It was great. And I also loved you and Christine. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with the conversation that came about um, when the trailer came, on, uh, came out. And Twitter had a huge discussion on, like, these two women, they're black. They're not passing. Yeah. But you mentioned earlier that it was deliberately picking those yeah. two actors for this role. Can you elaborate on that? On that a little bit? Because, like, sure. I mean, I'm not on Twitter. I'm, I'm a kind of complete, uh, just like ignorant, honestly. But I have been told <laughs> of what happened. 
A, I found it really interesting that it happened and that there was still all this scrutiny around this stuff. Um, anyway, that's a side note. But part of me was a, a, a little bit pleased that it was sparking this conversation because that is slightly the intention. Um, the reason, aside from the fact that I can't think of two actors who are better for these roles, is that one, it felt very important for me to redress the balance. There are other white, there are other movies about white passing and they're all played by white actors who have no ties to the black community whatsoever. And that's not the full perspective. Like both of these women were socialized black. They were born black. They have that, you've got to, you can't just show one side of that story. That's one reasoning. The second reasoning was to put the audience in the black perspective. And the best way that I can think of to explain this is if you are a family and someone leaves and crosses the color line and says, I'm white now, you as a family member, you don't look at that person and go, yes, they're white. You only ever see them as black. You only ever see them as in danger and thinking, can't everyone else see what I'm saying? And that's the perspective that I wanted everyone to be in. It feels more real, it feels more frightening. I, it's fascinating that we all walk around on some level, isn't it? Kind of going, I see this and everyone must see the same thing. And it's not actually true. <laughs> you know, we all see different things. And that's also part of it. Thank you. But first of all, I wanna say that I saw your mother perform <gasps> here at the Lyric Opera, I believe more than once, and she was amazing. Um, so thank you for that. And I'm, I'm curious about what, how she feels about all this. But really what I want to say is that one of the scenes that I most enjoyed in the film was the scene at the big dance when, uh, because the, the, to, to portray that effervescent party in such a small little box on mm. the screen mm. Mm. was remarkable. But I loved the conversation between um, the character that Bill Camp played, isn't he everywhere? He's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And um, Irene, yeah. in terms of who's passing and what they're passing from, and mm -hmm. the whole mm -hmm. conversation was fascinating to me. And I, my sense, of course, was that there were multiple layers to it. Um, but I liked the fact that she was so much more herself with him than she was with any other character in the film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you could talk about well, thank you for pointing that out. And that I, it's, I'm glad you say that. And that is, I always thought of that scene as being like a sort of the moment that you just take the thing off the pressure cooker for a minute and let a little bit of the steam out and then you like slam it back on again. You know, and it functions very deliberately like that. And it is that because it's Claire's effect. It's Claire's sort of moment of exuberance that just intoxicates everyone before they get really frightened that they might have been let out of the box a little bit. And for me, it was always this moment where Irene reveals herself. And you see this flash of someone who's kind of acerbic and witty. And you're like, oh, you might be an entirely different person if you were allowed yourself or if you were allowed. And you're not. And, the, and also, I wanted to point out that the reason she feels safe in that moment is because she knows that he has a secret too, that he, is, that he is passing and he's in the closet and he's there with his wife and nobody thinks that he's really there with his wife, you know, and, and he's has a kind of fetishization going on and she sort of berates him for that. And, you know, and she is able to, I mean, she does something kind of scandalous in that moment because she essentially outs Claire. And the only, and that's, it's sort of in the book it's, it is in the book, I take that back, but it's not as explicit as I made it. And I made it explicit for a very deliberate reason to highlight his closeted homosexuality because in those sort of secret spaces between each other, she's like, you know, we're gonna share these bits of information together. And this feels safe because of that. Um, but in terms of shooting that scene, it wasn't hard. It was, the, it was the most joyful day of the shoot. And it also happened to be the last day of the shoot. And there were, there were people there who 
there was maybe three or four people who knew like the real dance moves and taught some people some things, but mostly it was just people letting rip and going for it in the most beautiful way. And I just got to witness it and shoot it as best I could. And it was a joy. I think we have time for one last question here. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Enjoyed the film. Um, I want to ask about music because I really love what you said about the film being quiet, but you have that piano riff yes. because black people weren't safe in the world at large, but they were in Harlem because they could enjoy themselves and party. So they're passing into entertainment and going back into a violent world. So I love if you could talk about that music because I love how the yeah. little piano riff was. I'm there. really happy to talk about that piece of music. <laughs> yes. There's a whole like subplot to the film that nobody will ever know or pick up on apart from me, but I'm going to share it with you now. <laughs> so that piece of music is by an extraordinary Ethiopian pianist called Emohoi Gwebru, who re released an album in the 60s as part of the Ethiopic Jazz series. Um, she's now, she's still alive. She's 97, I believe, and she's been in exile and she lives in a convent in, in Israel now. She didn't write a lot of music, but I came across this piece of music when I was redrafting one of the drafts of the script. And I heard it and it was kind of amazing because I, it was so, you know, as a director, one of the hardest jobs is explaining to everyone tone. You know, it's like a very difficult thing to do to like explain to all your heads of department, everyone working on the movie, the, what the tone, what the feeling of the movie is, like what it, how it looks and how it looks in my head and how it feels. It's a really difficult thing to communicate. And I heard that piece of music and I thought, this is the movie. This is, if I can go as far as to say, this is what the movie looks like, how this sounds. And then I looked at, to see what the piece of music was and realized that the track was called Homeless Wanderer. So at that point I was like, okay, well this is going to be really the one piece of music. There's, there are other significant pieces of music, obviously, in the town hall, but they're all practical. And there's only one time where there is a, a human voice used, and that's deliberately right at the end in the party scene. I wanted to have a woman's voice. I specifically wanted to have Alberta Hunter. But the, the homeless wanderer became this sort of funny thing in my head. I was like, well, if I'm going to think in terms of th themes, you know, like m movie directors think in terms of everyone's got their theme, but I only really want to use this one piece of music ever this piece of music is claire's theme but it's stuck inside irene's head on a loop and it never resolves and she can't get it out and it has this monotony to it and then i got dev Hines in and i said okay dev i want irene's theme but i don't want it to be a piece of score i want it to be a character i want it to be the guy that lives across the street and he's learning to play the trumpet and he can't find his voice. You know, he's l looking around to find his expression of himself in the trumpet. And at the beginning of the movie, he's playing scales. And if you listen very carefully, if you go back and watch it again, he's playing scales. And then by the end of the movie, he has found his voice and it sounds like Homeless Wanderer because that obviously unlocks something in Irene. And aside, that is really the only scoring <laughs> in, in the whole film. And that, it just sort of felt lonely on some level, but also soulful to have something that was pared down and spoke very specifically to those two voices and those two voices alone. So thank you for asking that question. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, so speaking of loop and infinite loops in our heads, I want to I thank you. I want to thank uh, the American Writers Museum and Netflix for hosting this really wonderful interview and to the audience for joining us this evening, both here in person and on the interwebs. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, thank you. Thank you.